the lot, MS, serves as co-director with Cody Swift of the River Sticks Foundation and as the interim executive director of the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, director of the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund, and on the board of directors of the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. The River Sticks team undertakes deeply engaged relational philanthropy supporting social justice, ethical and innovative integration of the psychedelic movement into broader society, addressing mental, spiritual, and ecological crises through biocultural responsibility, and respectful allyship with indigenous traditional knowledge holders. Miriam works personally and professionally to promote health in all systems. Her background is as a complex systems facilitator, soil scientist, educator, and community organizer. Her work aims to increase broad-based community and ecological resilience through supporting high leverage initiatives at the intersection of biological, sociocultural, and psychospiritual diversity. T. Cody Swift, MA, MFT, received his degree in existential phenomenological psychology and brings over 13 years working in the field of psychedelic research. He has served as a therapist guide in the Johns Hopkins psilocybin and cancer anxiety trials, as well as developed qualitative inquiries into the subjective aspects of participants' experience with psilocybin and MDMA. Through the River Sticks Foundation, he has also worked over five years supporting indigenous communities in the conservation of their sacred plant medicines, as with the Native American church in the preservation of peyote. And joining me today is Miriam Volat and Cody Swift of the River Sticks Foundation and many other incredible projects. Welcome, Miriam and Cody. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us, Jen. Awesome. Well, I know we have a lot to talk about, some really powerful projects. I would love to, um, to jump in and to start with River Sticks Foundation that you both um, are the, the co-directors of, the co-leaders of this incredible organization. Could you tell our community more about the mission of the River Sticks Foundation and how you grew into supporting indigenous sovereignty and traditional plant medicine ways? Mm. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in there, Miriam. Yes, um, please. So I, I've been uh, running the River Sticks Foundation since about 2007. And um, it was a foundation that was left to me and, and I had a lot of... Um, discretion on how to guide the mission and focus of the foundation. And um, I had a, a degree in psychology at the time, an undergrad. And um, during that time, I actually had a um, my first pivotal mushroom, psilocybin mushroom experience up in Washington State. And I saw very clearly the, the disillusion of constructed reality. Um, it wasn't a disillusion of ego, but the, the thingness of a cup, for instance, the cupness of a cup dissolved. And I was just looking purely at what it was beyond the, the construct that we, we ascribed to it. And I was just so amazed by how, um, how just um, incredible of a tool it could be for understanding the nature of the mind and the relationship between the mind and reality that it led me to, um, I guess, down this incredible rabbit hole of finding my way to, uh, to Johns Hopkins University. And they were just launching an early trial, uh, giving psilocybin mushrooms to, or synthetic psilocybin uh, from the mushroom to uh, cancer patients to help them alleviate the fear and anxiety uh, that was coming up um, relative to their cancer and facing mortality. And that um, what we understood is that the mechanism of action was that there was this dissolution of the, the construct of self and all the attachments that we hold on to in the face of, of death, you know, our attachment to all the things that we've done in life and, you know, all our roles and identities, all the things that we feel are being stripped of us and, and gives people an opportunity to, uh, to experience themselves and experience life beyond the construct. Mm -hmm. And um, that just was so compelling to me. And it was so interesting that this research had started again, especially at 
um, an esteemed institution like Johns Hopkins and that they were taking the risk and the lead to do this research again. And I, I knew I had to, to help any way that I could. So I called them up and they, they indicated that they started the trial really without any sources of funding. Uh, so it was a perfect, a perfect marriage at the moment um, of uh, being able to provide funding for that research. And um, in those early days, we had no conviction that it would actually really work. Um, you know, there's a lot of promising indication, but, you know, we, we were still sort of cautiously optimistic and seeing over and over these incredible transformations um, led us to really commit more and more deeply to funding in the movement. And I think we've given close to um, or perhaps over $10 million uh, over the last 13 years to support the ongoing research with Hefter, uh, MAPS, USONA, um, the organizations philanthropically that have been really carrying the torch and, and building the base of research. Um, but it was interesting about seven or eight years ago, um, I felt kind of a shift in the movement and there was a lot of new funding and interest coming in. And it was during that time that I had met a, an elder and um, he was at the time a, a, the president of the Native American Church of North America, uh, Sandor Iron Rope. And he introduced me to um, the Native American Church. And I had heard about the Native American Church early on, but I never really understood how inclusive it was as as a religion and um, as a um, organizing body and that uh, over a quarter of all Native Americans in the United States have some involvement in the Native American church and that they, um, as their primary sacrament, use ritually uh, peyote, which is a, a mescaline containing cacti for their, their ceremonial rituals. And um, from the very beginning of working in this foundation, I've always longed to, to do some work with Native American communities. I think I've always been aware since I was a young kid of the, um, the traumas and the genocides and um, you know, the, the great cultural um, extermination that had taken place. Um, with the Native American communities. And I, I really struggled over years for how, how to really find a, a strategic and leveraged way that would actually be supportive of those communities. And it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to find inroads into those communities and, and to build trusted partnerships in a way that you can actually be effective. And you know, eight years ago, meeting Sandor Iron Rope, um, it just felt like there was this, this really um, rare and unique opportunity for a white philanthropic organization to, to really partner with um, uh, key members of the Native American church and, and really work together towards this, this shared mission of ensuring the, the conservation of their their sacrament. And I think that the Native American church at that time was just coming into a recognition that, um, that their sacrament was threatened, that there was a real conservation uh, concern and, and threat. So I think there was this, this, uh, this openness and, and recognition that they, um, that they needed partnership and they needed support. And um, so that was the kind of the birth of, our involvement in this and you know, it's taken um, a lot of trust building a lot of patience and a lot of continued showing up and there's um, frankly been a lot of distrust in our intentions and and why we're getting involved in this and what is our intention with peyote what is our intention in, in, in supporting and and we just have to continue to 
um, to show up and trying to be in our, our greatest integrity and really listen to the Native American elders and what they need. And, um, and we've built trust to the point where we've purchased um, 600 acres of conservation land in Southwest Texas and gifted that to um, the IPCI, the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, um, which is led by a board of all Indigenous elders. And, um, and Miriam can speak a little bit more later to the, to the fund that's kind of come out of our work with peyote, but um, then extending, using our, uh, the lessons that we've learned with peyote and working with the peyote tribes and extending that knowledge to, um, to ayahuasca and the tribes who historically use ayahuasca, Iboga in Gabon, um, and even working with some of the tribes who have now adopted um, the toad medicine um, and, and protecting the toad. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah. Wow, thank you so much for, for that incredible uh, summary of, of a very powerful and, and deep journey that I can hear how much the effort has been on uh, on trust building and, and being able to now step into uh, creating and supporting a whole range of projects that are um, rooted in that kind of community leadership and that trust that can be so difficult to build, I think, especially given the current state of, of the plant medicine and psychedelic field. Um, I would love to, before we dive into talking in particular about these incredible projects that you both support at, at through River Sticks and in many ways, um, I want to talk about why that trust building is so important and really um, pretty singular in the current context that we're in. Um, so I'm wondering if you both would, would share with us a little more about how you see the current state um, of the clinical field of decriminalization and how that is impacting indigenous sovereignty when it comes to these sacred plant medicines. Well, maybe I can jump in here. That's a, that's a very big question. Um, and I think as you could hear in what Cody was sharing, we've developed really through learning experience a, a very deep commitment to supporting um, as the psychedelic field, clinical decriminalization, all the different aspects of it um, moves forward, supporting um, those efforts to happen in such a way that they don't um, do harm to indigenous plant medicine um, communities, knowledge holding communities, that they, um, you know, uh, respect and even do benefit sharing and support indigenous sovereignty uh, when it comes to um, how they engage. Um, in the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund um, that we can talk about a little bit later, which is an indigenous led um, organization that we're supporting the creation of, um, one of the phrases that we use a lot is right relationship. And so we're really learning about and exploring what is the right relationship between uh, sort of mainstream society. And sometimes we don't think of psychedelics as being mainstream society, but really there is this mainstreaming of the use of these medicines to address mental health crisis, to address um, the crisis of meaning and connection and nature connection that people are really seeking, you know, really seeking healing. And so um, we're really looking at how can that flourish and go forward without um, um, impacting negatively indigenous sovereignty and impacting negatively the ecologies and territories and cultures um, and communities on the ground that have relied on their plant medicines for you know, thousands and thousands of years. And so, you know, Cody shared that story about, you know, 13, 14 years ago, um, this, um, you know, research that was happening at Johns Hopkins. And um, I've heard Cody say before, he could never have imagined that the clinical field and that um, psychedelics and 
um, pharmaceutical companies and in research and in, you know, becoming like a, a whole economy and an industry into itself could ever have happened and that it would have moved on from just sort of a research into how to find really innovative ways of healing into this, you know, incredible industry. And then at the same time, you have um, people making, you know, legal and policy efforts to change, um, you know, how these medicines are held, you know, moving them um, out of being, you know, criminalized into being able to be accessible, to be used as healing. And so, you know, on the surface of it, that can just look very exciting, very wonderful. Um, of course, there's some harm reduction needed. Um, but what we're finding is a really important place is how does this mainstreaming interface with these traditional knowledge communities? And um, so what we've done is we've looked to a few different places to figure out how to do that. And, you know, um, one thing that we talk about a lot and that we've talked about with pharmaceutical companies that are interested in um, doing things in an ethical way uh, is that there actually are international protocols, the Nagoya protocols and the biodiversity protocols that exist within the UN framework. There's uh, 176 countries that have signed on to those protocols. They took over 35 years to develop with um, uh, many, many, many indigenous leaders from all over the world. And that's one of the things that we use as a guide, because what they tell us is that when you have cultural knowledge or biological heritage, meaning like also molecules that have cultural heritage significance, that what is um, um, appropriate is to do both consent work and benefit sharing work. And so if you think about what that means, it means that as the psychedelic movement moves forward, it behooves us to really consider how, uh, and talk to and listen to indigenous traditional knowledge holding communities about what they feel is appropriate, what they feel is important, and then also equally important to that sort of consent and consultation piece, which is very difficult to do and takes time, is um, to do benefit sharing. And so one of the reasons why we've created this um, Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund is to actually support um, people to be able to have a vehicle that can do benefit sharing. And what benefit sharing means is that if you are using something that has cultural significance um, uh, in a way where you get some benefit from it, and if you talk about like in the clinical field, a pharmaceutical company, for example, um, getting benefit from say like psilocybin molecule, under the Nagoya protocols, they're actually responsible to do benefit sharing from the traditional knowledge holders who've utilized that um, medicine. Um, and so um, uh, anyways, th that's kind of what I would say about that is that, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of potential to do this in a really, really good way. And there's a lot of potential to kind of do business as usual and overlook these really core pieces of as we have um, this kind of healing revolution happening, how do we actually really, really ensure that traditional knowledge holding communities that have um, biological and cultural heritage rights um, to many of these medicines are also um, supported, um, that their futures are insured, that they're here in a hundred years from now, the way that they wanna be here, and that they're actually in charge of and leading their cultural, biological, and territorial conservation efforts. Um, so, you know, one of the things that it's hard to talk about, but you know, as we've been doing this work, we're learning more and more is that, you know, as the psychedelic renaissance is in this moment where a lot of the structures aren't fully in place about how this is all going to work, 
that we really need to weave into the structures and how they're placed, this kind of benefit sharing, this kind of respect um, uh, for these communities. And that it needs to be done on their terms. And sometimes that's slower than you know, our traditional culture would like it. They want everything really fast. And, um, and so, yeah, I would just, I would just like to propose that for this revolution or Renaissance movement to be successful, we actually have to be in right relationship and we have to be in ethical relationships with these communities. Otherwise we've missed a core opportunity for healing. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that call. I can, I can hear how much, um, you know, I really resonated when you were saying we don't think of psychedelics as being mainstream and yet they are, you know, it is becoming this, this field, this industry, this Renaissance, and it's bringing with it all of the, the current um, oppressive systems of existing mainstream culture that is just flowing into it currently. And there's this opportunity to really shift the way we do it and weave in these values, this right relationship to make mm -hmm. something different so that when it solidifies, it, it really can be worthy of the values of a lot of the medicine um, that, that folks feel drawn to in the first place. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Very, very powerful work that you both do. Um, I know we touched already um, on some, some of the outlines of these projects, but I would love to get to ask about um, first the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, um, very powerful very deep work. And I wondered if you could just share with our community about the work that IPCI focuses on and, and how you're doing it. Yeah. Well, maybe I can just just frame high level again. Um, you know, what, what really initially drew us to, to working with the Native American church and um, in developing the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative was, you know, I think this, this pairing of realizing Okay, we're we're starting to understand that these medicines have have remarkable healing potential, and that's becoming validated in the Western ethos, and it's becoming validated by these esteemed universities and 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 Michael Pollan, and you know, the starting to to take hold. So there's this moment of of understanding the power of these medicines, but then at the same time realizing that there are communities who have used these, these medicines for hundreds, if not thousands of years and have intact cultural um, norms and, and uh, rituals and, and containers uh, that they've evolved over all these years to appropriately hold these medicine experiences within their culture. And then further realizing that Native American communities are, are suffering. You know, I'll, I'll just say that straight out. They, they are suffering. This isn't something of the, of the past that they've been harmed in the past, but those traumas continue to reverberate and the traumas continue. You know, just a, a shocking statistic that, that, uh, that continues to disturb me is that the average life expectancy of Native Americans in the United States is in the mid 50s. You know, these these people's life expectancy is only to, you know, about half of what we expect for white communities, and I, I just think that's that's atrocious. The the diabetes, the alcoholism, suicide it's it's rampant, and these communities need desperately need support. And so there's this moment of recognizing, okay, that these medicines are powerful healers. These communities are already using them. And what they need most is just uh, backup and support and, and strategic thinking on, on how to, um, to ensure that they have continued access to that medicine. And that's what they want most. And so that, that listening to what they needed really led to, uh, to IPCI and trying to um, starting to, to fund an effort to bring people down to Texas and really, and starting to visit ranches and figuring out what, what is the situation down there? What are all the conservation threats? And, um, and realizing that we needed to, to start building a robust conservation strategy. And, um, and that 
came out of um, recommendations um, looking at multitudes of conservation threats and, um, and purchasing the 600 acres, which, um, which is kind of a, a toe in, it's a foothold in uh, what has been called the black box of <laughs> Southwest Tex Texas ranching situation and, um, and really having a presence down there. And I think something we didn't anticipate is that one of the most important conservation strategies actually doesn't look like conservation from a scientific, scientific perspective. It's really been first and foremost, giving the Native American church uh, a home, a place that they can call home, a place in the medicine gardens for the first time where they can go and feel safe, being on their knees, praying to, to their holy medicine in the ground as it grows with the sun and the rain and, um, and having a place to commune with their medicine again. And they, they haven't had access to that. So restoring their connection to, to the medicine and the ecology in which it grows, I think has been, um, you know, a really big first conservation step that we didn't anticipate. And, you know, from our Western perspectives, we thought, okay, we need to build this many greenhouses to, you know, to yield this many peyotes a year, but um, it's been a very different approach um, and really getting behind the Native American communities and really understanding that that this prayerful relationship to the to the medicine in the ground and being able to harvest it from a spiritual perspective where the the Navajo Diné people will will make their um, you know their bee pollen their corn pollen offering for instance um, you know it's um, yeah, it's, it's been very, very rewarding to, to see that connection starting to be, to be restilled. Yeah. So Miriam, I'll, I'll let you talk about the other conservation strategies there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it, this um, piece that Cody mentioned of reconnection has been really, really key. Like with peyote in the United States in particular, um, in the olden days, back in the day, and we hear a lot of really wonderful stories about this, um, whole families used to travel from wherever they were, whether it was, you know, Montana or Oklahoma or um, New Mexico, Arizona, they would um, travel essentially pilgrimage down into South Texas and they had relationships with um, ranchers who were um, the land owners um, that were really positive and constructive and they would come onto the land, um, and, um, spend a couple weeks and they would harvest, um, medicine for ceremonies that they knew were going to happen. These were healing ceremonies. So they would harvest the medicine that they needed, and then they would travel back home and bring that medicine back to their families, back to their communities, um, but when the DEA got involved in actually in regulating what was happening with the medicine, um, they gave um, licenses to distributors. Um, they were called payateros, who were then the only ones who were allowed to actually do that um, harvesting and distribution and sales. And so um, the distribution of the medicine turned into a commercial enterprise just by a few people. And as often happens when things become commercialized, um, there started to be over harvesting. There so, so this, so this um, process of um, regulation really created a separation between the Native American church and ABNDN. We call ABNDN, we mentioned too, because they're one of the largest um, peyote organizations and uh, it stands for Aze Binagaha of Diné Nation and they don't use the church language. So we often say Native American church and ABNDN. But um, but in this last um, five to 10 years, uh, the Native American church and ABNDN communities have really felt like 
this disconnection that was created through the regulatory process um, was, it, it leads to a lot of different issues, not just even the medicine being harvested improperly, not just the poaching situation, but um, their communities not knowing where the medicine comes from and not having that connection to the territory, to the land, to the pilgrimage process, um, to the intergenerational transfer of knowledge that happens when you're really tending um, your own medicine and therefore your spiritual life and your way of life. And so a lot of what IPCI focuses on is that reconnection. So through youth programming, through pilgrimage, um, uh, through conversations and knowledge about the life cycle um, of the medicine, um, through preserving tradition, um, song, instruments. Um, and at this point now, we also have a culturally appropriate nursery that took four years to design um, as a collaboration between folks who know about, um, you know, propagation and, and things like that at scale, um, but also with traditional um, knowledge holders, elders, um, and that nursery is approved by the DEA and we will be um, uh, on leases that we have with um, private landholders and ranchers who've chosen to go back to some of the more old ways of having relationships with um, Native American church members. Uh, we will be doing trainings in um, ecological harvest. Um, elders will be coming in and retraining youth in doing spiritual harvest, so doing harvest with offerings. And then we will be replanting into um, the habitat and places that have been over harvested and things like that, um, babies from uh, that nursery. And um, the organization is really, really just now starting to really grow. And along with this relationship of um, replanting and bringing balance back into the peyote habitat, there's also work being done, community engagement work around um, conservation, biocultural conservation. So it's the biology, it's the ecology, but it's also the culture and bringing the culture into the kind of modern times um, uh, fully intact, but also able to adjust with the times. And, you know, I think it's really important um, back to what we were talking about before that, um, you know, mainstream US culture and the psychedelic movement really, really respect and honor um, these efforts, you know, I've heard, you know, one of our board members who um, is from the Oto uh, Missouri tribe, which was one of the original signers of the Native American church charter, um, which was um, put into place in 18, 18 and uh, help me out here, Cody, in 1918, um, that, um, you know, um, that was the charter was put in place to really protect the ceremony because as a church, it was something that then the government could understand. Um, and so, you know, the, like the, the Oto Missouri, who I was just sharing about, they were one of the original um, signers of that. And um, one of our board members who represents that tribe um, you know, I've heard him say before for Native Americans, you know, we've had our land taken away, our children taken away, our access to our food taken away, and we have this medicine and it's our last thing. It's the thing that we have to give to our grandchildren. It's the thing that we have to support our communities to be healthy into the future. And, you know, it really does behoove us at this point in history in the United States to just respect how Native American church and AB Indian people want to navigate working with their medicine. And, you know, um, so IPCI is in support of that and works to do that. And back to when we were talking about decriminalization, an example would be to not include peyote to not do anything that undermines the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, because that's an act and a, um, and a part of our federal government that Native Americans really rely on to protect their, it's not just their 
their medicine, but also their way of life. And so anytime when we're looking at doing legal or policy change around um, psychedelics, it's really, really important that we don't make a move with peyote, which is the medicine of this land, without having the indigenous people of this land take the first steps on that and be the lead on that. Um, and so IPCI has um, tried to get the word out and communicate in a, as respectful a manner as possible about that and, and has had some successes. Um, the California legislation to decriminalize psychedelics actually um, left peyote out very specifically. And there's some of the other municipal um, efforts that have done that. And it seems to be something that's gotten out in a good way and being picked up by people is something that is valuable and um, healing for our society, um, for people who are making rule changing to, um, you know, just is honor that ERFA amendment. Um, and thank you, Miriam. That was um, such a powerful overview of IPCI's work. And it is uh, incredible to see some of the the broader policy shifts that are happening where folks are realizing, you know, decriminalization can include respect for indigenous sovereignty and and, and uh, indigenous plant medicine ways. And how do we continue to replicate that across the entire field to make mm. sure that that, that relation, that right relationship is really woven in? Um, well, I know a, a very important way that um, that this work is progressing is through the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund, which is just launching. Um, could you tell us more about what the work of the fund is focused on um, and how it came together? Um, yeah, I can I can just start high level. Um, and the last thing I'll say on on the peyote front is you know, just from a kind of a pure conservation perspective that uh, we've heard um, from our, our cactologists who have been a part of the project that without intervention, that peyote could be um, really harvested to extinction uh, within 20 years. And, um, uh, you know, that's just... We can't let that happen. I mean, both from an ecological perspective, botanical, but um, from this cultural perspective too. And uh, and so, and these strategies, uh, we believe, will really help reverse the tide on that. Uh, what Miriam spoke to of of the replanting, growing the peyote to about three years old in, in nurseries, and then re repopulating the gardens, but also ensuring that all harvesting is done um, in, a, in a regenerative way. If you cut the peyote just right, it will actually re, regrow. It will, it will grow in multitude. Um, so I think really getting, um, getting a foothold on these uh, conservation efforts and also working with tribes. Um, during our work with IPCI, we began funding um, uh, conservation um, assessments um, through our partner ICERS, which is based in Spain, through uh, Ben Delonen and co-funding with Dr. Bronner Foundation, doing conservation assessments on ayahuasca as, as well as iboga, uh, really to ascertain uh, what are the threats to these biocultures as well. And I think we all know there is a great proliferation of interest in ayahuasca as well as iboga used um, to, uh, uh, to get the Ib ibogaine alkaloid, which is very helpful for those uh, struggling with opiate addiction and um, proliferation of, of clinics down in Mexico and Canada using iboga, ibogaine. But we were virtually in the dark in terms of what, how this demand, this great increase in demand was affecting uh, the natural habitats, the, the wild populations and the indigenous cultures using these medicines. And um, you know, each of these medicines has their own particular um, kind of risk and concern. But of course, what we found is that each are greatly threatened 
And I think in the, the, the backdrop of this is really remembering what happened to the indigenous communities that historically used the psilocybin mushroom, the Mazatec communities, and, and talking with um, Kat Harrison, who, um, who is an ethnobotanist who's worked with those tribes for many, many decades, and realizing that we, we had this experience back in the, in the 60s and 70s, where there was a sudden great expansion of interest in psychedelics in the West kind of an ungrounded, um, unfettered, um, very frothy, fervent interest, you know, out of the healing potential, of course, leading to a huge influx of, influx of tourism and, uh, and consumerism down into those regions and basically um, demolished that cultural lineage. Uh, from what Kat Harrison said, the, the, those communities basically were so appalled with how their medicine was being used that they, that they withdrew and basically buried uh, the tradition. And now it's, it's very, very difficult to find the threads to the original ways that the mushroom was, being, was, was held and used and, and their songs and their cultural container. And as a result, you know, we, you know, those communities have had that great loss, but I think there's a loss in general in terms of the whole psychedelic movement that we have, have this great disconnect from the original mushroom traditions. And yes, we've, we've sort of resurrected new techniques and methodologies for how to use psilocybin, but, um, but I would I would regard that as a as a great tragedy that uh, that we are not uh, connected in that way to the original um, to the original ways um, and so I I think we really wanted to do the best that we could um, you know Miriam really taking the lead on this and and um, doing an incredible job to to create a, a vehicle and platform that could both raise funds from um, people coming to the psychedelic movement and, and being interested in the psychedelic movement from philanthropists and business entre entrepreneurs alike, um, raising the funding, but also building the trusted partnerships with the indigenous tribes on the ground to create an opportunity where funding from the West could meet uh, indigenous communities on the ground and really create a, a trusted partnership to ensure that these, um, these cultures and, um, and ceremonies and languages and, and ecological relationships were not again lost like they were with the Mazatec. Um, so that's kind of a high level uh, aspiration and, um, and Miriam has just done an unbelievable job um, pulling together um, the, the grantee relationships and, um, and building the, the staff and, and really creating a whole governance structure, uh, an unprecedented governance structure, which really um, places indigenous voices first and foremost um, and woven through every decision of the, of the fund and how uh, funds are both raised and de um, deployed in those communities. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, deep, deep cultural nuance and sensitivity and relationship building. And, um, you know, just again, a, a deep bow to, to her and to ICers and to, and to Bronners for, um, you know, coming together to, to create this opportunity right now before, you know, before uh, things get too big and, um, and, and again, we're in the same situation that we were um, in the 60s and 70s. So I'll, I'll pass this to Miriam now. Well, I, that was a really, um, that was a really good summary of the aspiration of the fund and, um, 
You know, I think one of the things that we recently did with our conservation committee and our conservation committee is made up of uh, community leaders from each of the biocultures that were uh, directly supporting. So Iboga, Bufo, Peyote, Ayahuasca, and then we're much more quiet. It's a much more quiet um, relationship with the mushroom people for um, reasons that Cody just mentioned where that's very, very delicate. Um, but we have representatives on our conservation committees from each of those biocultures. And then we also have technical advisors. Um, and one of the things that we just did, it was about a four month process is that we really deeply worked on, um, the governance structure, the mission, um, the vision, the language that we use, and um, basically a map for how the relationships from the biocultures themselves, the communities themselves, um, work inward towards the decision making of the fund. And so, you know, as Cody mentioned before, we um, we did these assessments, and um, the assessments now are ongoing. So the basis of the fund is these community engaged um, assessments where people on the ground are really talked to about um, what do you need for your culture and your relationship with your medicine and your territory to be intact in a hundred years, in 200 years, to have everything that you need to do to not just protect yourself, but to truly and deeply um, thrive and have a really, really good life and an unbroken thread of um, communicating this um, precious traditional knowledge that you have um, so that your grandchildren, great grandchildren have it. And so that's kind of the basis of um, the assessment work um, that we do. And then in each of those biocultures, we now have teams on the ground that make relationships with projects, with families, with individuals who will then, who are then um, the grantees. We've actually done approval of our initial suite of grantees, and that approval was done by that conservation committee. Um, and the people who are on the conservation committee actually talk with their spiritual advisors, talk with their elders, talk with their families um, about everything that's happening um, in the fund, the decisions that are being made. And so we actually essentially not only have a governance structure where representatives from each of the biocultures are unequivocally responsible for the decisions, like Cody and I and the Brawners who are also seed funders and ICers who are part of the technical team, we don't actually make the decisions. Sometimes, you know, in the last several months while decisions were being made, I, I didn't know, you know, if a project that I maybe thought was important was going to get approved or not. And it actually, it's not that it didn't matter because we're there and we're in support, but we've, um, we literally have an indigenous led um, organization and governance structure um, in order to create that real trust on the ground. And then also in order to ensure that we're being guided by what the biocultural communities themselves want to see happen. Um, and so um, that kind of governance structure is a lot of work, um, but it's also just, um, you know, extremely powerful. And one of the things I'll share um, that's coming out of it is that um, representatives from the different biocultures are finding what they have in common. And there's a lot of actually strengthening and support um, in that kind of multicultural unity building. Um, that's really um, interesting and wonderful. Um, yeah, so I think the, the main thing that we're trying to do just this year is um, for the next three or four years, we've looked at projects on the ground that can really bring in deep infrastructure, deep systemic support um, to efforts that will be able to continue to grow over the next 10, 20, 25 years to really strengthen the communities. A lot of them are about accessing territory. A lot of them about language preservation. A lot of them are about 
connection to um, between elders and young people um, uh, to pass traditional knowledge. And, um, and we're looking to raise, uh, we have 15 million more dollars um, that we're hoping to raise this year. And all of those funds will be directed into the um, communities in those five biocultures um, to projects. Some of the funds also go into ongoing assessment. Like for example, with Buvo, the Yaki tribe has asked to have a really like a university led um, uh, uh, sort of environmental assessment to look at what the health of the populations of the toads actually are so that we can have that data. Um, and, um, and then we'll continue to do fundraising from there. Um, Brawners and River Sticks, our commitment is to, um, within the next 18 months or so, it, the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund will actually fully launch into being its own organization and have its, um, you know, an Indigenous director and fully be an Indigenous-led um, organization in that way. So, a little bit of that. Wow, that's an incredible vision and transition that you have planned, and I'm so grateful to get to hear about um, the the work and the the leadership of of the knowledge and wisdom holders, the the traditional keepers um, of this wisdom we all need. Yeah, there's about thirty um, thirty projects that have been improved by the conservation committee. Um, and um, and then also when they've been approved, they've also been, you know, sort of brought back into the community to like do double checks that everybody trusts these organizations to carry forward things for their whole communities. So it's been been quite a process. Wow. That is deep work and so vital and life life giving and life sustaining. It's really incredible to hear about. Um, I would love to just ask you both one final question around um, how our community can support your efforts and the broader work of Indigenous sovereignty, if you have any words of wisdom or suggested actions that we could take. Hmm. Well, something that has come to me throughout this conversation is just wanting to acknowledge something of the double-edged sword that we're, that we're holding here, which is you know, I think there's this real <clears throat> imperative um, that we have right now to elevate these conversations and, and, and raising awareness about these communities. Um, and, and a big part of that is, is frankly, fundraising and, uh, and working with Michael Pollan, um, both with the, um, the chapter he wrote in his latest book, um, this is your mind on plants. He wrote a chapter on, on mescaline and, and heavily featured the work with IPCI. And, you know, the double-edged sword is that um, uh, it's important to bring the awareness out, but there's also uh, a risk in that, in, in these communities being exposed and, and it increases the, the political intensity that, um, that I think a lot of those communities can already face, um, and so there's a there's a delicateness in in even raising awareness and 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 talking about this work. Um, but I I would say that I think one of the most important things um, that that we can all do is just become educated, uh, and I, I don't mean that in a in a trite way, but really to educate ourselves about. Uh, about these communities and their medicines and how they've been held historically, uh, really learning about the Native American church, learning about uh, the Buiti people in Gabon. Um, you know, I, I think reading Michael Pollan's chapter um, you know, is, is, uh, is a great place to start. Uh, Houston Smith has done some incredible uh, research on a, um, a book he wrote um, regarding the Native American church. Um, so yeah, I, I would say just educating and then just bringing the conversations to the fore, you know, reminding each other of, um, of these communities and the importance of, of supporting and being mindful 
in terms of mindful choices around the medicines that we consume, you know, to be thoughtful about, um, you know, uh, choosing uh, to use uh, natural bufo various uh, toad venom versus a synthetic 5-MeO DMT. I'm not saying do one or the other, but uh, do your research and, and really become informed, you know, uh, really become informed what it means to, to ingest peyote and, and listening to the tribes who are, you know, are strongly, strongly and desperately pleading uh, white people to, to leave their medicine alone uh, because it is so scarce. It's not because there's something wrong about white people. It's because their medicine is truly facing a, a conservation threat. And, and white people have access to psilocybin and LSD and ayahuasca and 5-MeO and DMT and 2CB and all the and MDMA and all these incredible different compounds. But the Native American people, it's firmly in their tradition to use peyote. Um, they, they do not see it as a psychedelic. They do not have access or interest in any other of the medicines. Peyote is what they have. And um, so in deference to, to those communities, um, I think it's, it's imperative that we, um, you know, we are really mindful of, of these uh, ecological and, and cultural uh, concerns and sensitivities. So, um, you know, I, I just, it's been a pleasure to, to share this with um, you know fellow therapists I know who are a part of this community here and um, who I know are a thoughtful bunch and um, you know, just thank you very much for listening. Um, Miriam, if you want to chime in too. Oh, you just said that all so so beautifully and perfectly. I mean, I think um, you know uh, I. I it's really wonderful to get to think about therapists, how therapists would think about this. And, you know, Cody's a therapist and, you know, so maybe I'll just end with sharing as an ecologist, which is actually my background and training. I, um, you know, not that I want to, but I do spend a fair amount of time thinking about that, you know, in the long view of time, we are in this moment of a six, the sixth greatest extinction that we've had here on this earth. And so I do tend to think about um, how important um, diversity is to just the beauty of this planet and earth that we get to live on. And so for me, um, this is just more of a personal share and maybe it will spark something for other people in the community. It's like in, in 300 years, I, I want um, all of this incredible beauty, cultural territories, you know, medicines to, to be here. And, um, you know, when we're, when we're looking at preserving diversity and biodiversity on the planet, sometimes there are these, these keystone or crucial um, members of, um, an of any community that it's really important that we support to continue. And I think these, um, these indigenous traditional um, medicine communities are that. They are, they are keystone to a healthy um, future uh, for all of us. Um, and I think right relationship wise, respecting their sovereignty and honoring them in a way of just sort of like good manners that the way to support them being here in many, 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 many years to come is, um, is about supporting them to take the lead on that. Um, I think that's a really important piece on this, you know, it's like listening. Um, so yeah, I just, um, I think this is part of a, you know, a prayer and a hope and a strategy for having humans be in a good, good, healthy way on the planet several hundred years from now. <laughs> that is the key. Definitely. What do we want to be here in the future is such a powerful question that I'll definitely be sitting with after this conversation. How do we make sure that these, these 
traditions, these plants, the biodiversity, the resiliency, the healing, the medicine is here um, when we look to a future instead of gone because of carelessness and, um, and harm. Really mm -hmm. grateful for both of you for sharing so much. Um, I'm just going to pop up the uh, two websites that folks can go to to learn a little bit more about both IPCI and the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund. We'll link to them in the blog as well. So folks can click there and find lots of information along with all of the, the links and connections to many of the topics mentioned throughout this incredible conversation. Um, I am so grateful to you both for sharing so much of your time with us um, and for bringing this kind of connection and, and healing and reciprocity uh, into the world. It's deeply, deeply needed. And it is such a powerful example of what we can do when we step into this work um, and do the, the deep trust building and community engagement that it really takes to do it right. Um, in right, in right relationship. I'll be meditating on that um, phrase as well for a while. So thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, Jen, thank you so much for your thoughtful listening and framing and, and for elevating this conversation. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it.